Thank you for joining us today on Earth File. Welcome to the program. I'm Ayola Kasim. Extreme weather events from scorching heat waves to unusually heavy downpours have caused widespread upheaval across the globe this year, with thousands of people killed and millions more displaced. In the last three months, monsoon rains unleashed disastrous flooding in Bangladesh and brutal heat waves surged parts of South Asia and Europe. Meanwhile, prolonged drought has left millions on the brink of farming in East Africa. Many residents here in Lagos also suffered from floods with at least two people reported missing. So many other states across the country from north to the south are not spared. Much of this, scientists say, is what is expected from climate change. We'll take a look at how many are suffering from the impact across the world today on the program. Just stay with us. With precious few trees left to slow the wind in this once fertile corner of southern Madagascar, red sand is blowing everywhere, onto fields, villages and roads, and into the eyes of children waiting for food aid parcels. Four years of drought linked by the United Nations to climate change, along with deforestation caused by people burning or cutting down trees to make charcoal or to open up land for farming, have transformed the area into a dust bowl. More than one million people in southern Madagascar currently need food handouts from the World Food Programme, a United Nations agency. Tarira, a mother of seven, is bringing her four-year-old son, Avoraza, to a World Food Programme's post where children are checked for signs of malnutrition. Avaraza has been struggling to put on weight. The checkup shows Avaraza is still malnourished, but not severely. Tarira receives sachets of a peanut based product known as Plumpy, used to treat malnourished children. But she says it's not enough for her son. When they return home, Avaraza receives a sachet of Plumpy which he eats in full without too much effort. It's because of the food that he is like this. It was not nutritionally complete. There are seven at home, so there wasn't enough food. The plumpy wasn't enough for him. Just a few minutes' walk from Tarira's village is a field local residents use to harvest crops. But most of what they planted so far this year has been blown away by the strong winds. Even rain brought by recent cyclones have not helped. We're going to show you our fields, you see. We cultivated corn, but the wind took away most of it. There is very little left. It's empty, and now the insects are eating what is left. Like many others in the region, Tarira and her family have sometimes been reduced to eating a type of cactus, known locally as rakita, which grows wild but provides little nutritional value and gives stomach pains. The world's fourth largest island and one of its most diverse ecosystems, with thousands of endemic species of plants and animals, Madagascar projects the image of a lush natural paradise. But in part of it, such as its far southern regions, the reality on the ground has changed. It's logical that it's the deterioration of the environment that led to all this trouble, not only in Android but also in Madagascar as a whole. We used to call Madagascar the Green Island, but sadly now it's more than a Red Island these days. The food crisis in the south built up over a period of years and has interconnected causes, including drought, deforestation, environmental damage, poverty and population growth, according to local authorities and aid organizations. With a population of 30 million, Madagascar has always known extreme weather events. But climate scientists say these will increase in frequency and severity. The United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change says 
Increased aridity is already being observed in Madagascar and projects that drought will increase. At the height of the food crisis in the south, the World Food Programme was warning that the island was at risk of seeing the world's first climate change farming. While some scientists say the current drought is within Madagascar's normal range of weather patterns, everyone agrees that the food crisis shows a country already struggling to cope with its climate and things will only get worse. Il n'arrive plus à comprendre exactement qu'est-ce qui se passe dans l'espace et dans le temps. We don't understand any more exactly what's happening in space and time. If you ask the elders, do you think it's going to rain? They say they don't know. Before, they could tell from the position of the moon when it was going to rain. But people did not manage to analyze any more. Before it was easy, people knew the periods of the year they could start planting because they knew when the rains would come, but not anymore. Avant, c'était simple. On sait qu'à de telle période à telle période, ils peuvent semer parce qu'ils savent que à partir de cette période, il va avoir les pluies. Mais ce n'est plus le cas en ce moment. Fyodor Mbanesem, who runs World Food Program's operations in the worst heat areas in southern Madagascar, said weather patterns had changed beyond recognition in recent years, and farmers could no longer figure out the best time to plant or harvest. Quand tu regardes, on voit un peu des enfants qui couraient de gauche à droite. C'était pas le cas avant. Donc maintenant, on a vu. When you look in the villages, you see children running left and right. That wasn't the case before. You've seen the change, and the analysis demonstrates that change. Due to a small harvest of tubers, such as sweet potatoes in September, October until December, even now we can still find sweet potatoes at the market, all that combined with food aid. For recently married 20-year-old Felix, who is burning down a wooded area to start cultivating it, the danger of deforestation is an abstract concept. At the moment, I'm waiting for the rain to fall because this land will not be fertile if it doesn't rain. So we're waiting for the rain. If it doesn't come, we will be in trouble. His urgent need was to try and grow food to feed his young wife, and his main concern is whether it would finally rain so he could get started. If there is no rain, I don't know what we'll do. We'll pray to God. <laughs> in late June, a team of climate scientists published a study in the journal Environmental Research, Climate. The researchers scrutinized the role climate change has played in individual weather events over the past two decades. The findings confirm warnings of how global warming will change our world and also make clear what information is missing. For their review paper, scientists drew upon hundreds of attribution studies or research that aims to calculate how climate change affects an extreme event using computer simulations and weather observations. There are also large data gaps in many low- and middle-income countries, making it harder to understand what's happening in those regions. Scientists say they have found a better understanding of how density of heat waves and extreme rainfall is changing due to climate change. Less understood, however, is how climate change influences wildfires and drought. With heat waves, it's highly probable that climate change is making things worse. So attribution science, and particularly um, with respect to, to weather events, is um, basically a bringing cause and effect together. So what we're doing with attribution science is to answer the question whether and to what extent human-induced climate change is a cause of the weather event that we have just experienced. And with I deliberately say a cause because it's never just no extreme weather event is one cause. There are always many different causal factors. And in attribution, we disentangle these different causes that lead to extreme weather and identify the role of climate change. In general, a heat wave that previously had a one in 10 chance of occurring is now nearly three times as likely. I'm picking at temperatures around one degree Celsius higher than it would have been without climate change. We know that pretty much all heat waves across the world have been made 
more intense and more likely by climate change. Um, and we know from looking at um, the impacts of these, um, particularly in places like Europe where we've got good data, that this has a serious impact on people's health. Um, and it also causes kind of economic disruption because people struggle to focus, people working outdoors can't work as effectively during heat. Um, so we have very high confidence there. Still, the impact varies by region, with some areas not receiving enough rain, the study says. I think what we see this sort of northern European or northern hemisphere summer is very much exactly what, what our review paper shows, that we have so many more heat waves. Um, we have heat waves in, in Europe, and uh, we have heat waves in Saudi Arabia at the moment, we have heat waves in China right now, we have heat waves in the US, and this is exactly what, what sort of the review paper also shows. We just see the frequency of heat waves has gone up so much. So this is, this is very much, we don't need to do attribution studies on every single one of them because we know already that climate change is uh, a key driver here. Scientists have a harder time figuring out how climate change affects drought. Some regions have suffered ongoing dryness. Warmer temperatures in the United States West, for example, are melting the snowpack faster and driving evaporation. And while East Africa droughts have yet to be linked directly to climate change, scientists say the decline in the spring rainy season is tied to warmer waters in the Indian Ocean. This causes rains to fall rapidly over the ocean before reaching the Horn. We know generally things like rainfall are getting more extreme. That's kind of generally true, but it's a little more nuanced. Um, but we have seen across the world a lot of serious and very damaging floods become more likely due to climate change. Heat waves and drought conditions are also worsening wildfires, particularly mega fires, those that burn more than 100,000 acres. Fire raged across the U.S. state of New Mexico in April. After a controlled burn set under much drier conditions than recognized, got out of control, according to the U.S. Forest Service. The fires burned 341,000 acres. I say wildfires. We, there are a couple of parts of the world, um, such as the Western US and Australia, um, where we're seeing serious changes happening now. Um, and there are other parts of the world, like the Amazon, where there are projected changes in the future, but we're not seeing those impacts yet. Um, and similarly for droughts, um, you have a couple of hotspots, um, but there are, the picture is more important for droughts in places where you're seeing very large impacts, like Eastern Africa, they have very serious famines. In the Horn of Africa, there is an increasing risk of farming. Drought is among the most devastating of the natural hazards, crippling food production, depleting pastures, disrupting markets, and at its most extreme, causing widespread human and animal deaths. Herders are often forced to seek alternative sources of food and water for their animals, which can create conflict between communities competing for the little resources available. We are facing a catastrophic situation in the Horn of Africa. There are more than 18 million people who are acutely food insecure as a result of the drought. Just to be clear, this is a situation we have not seen in the last 40 years. Four failed rains, a fifth failed rain that's upcoming. This really is catastrophic situations. We have large populations on the verge of famine facing starvation. Millions of heads of cattle, livestock that have died in the Horn. The latest estimate is more than seven million livestock in the Horn of Africa. About a third of the livestock, this means, uh, that vulnerable families rely on have died. What does that mean in practical terms? Poor, marginalized farming families no longer have access to milk for their children, for example. This is the type of catastrophic situation we're facing. The United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization and its partners are advocating for better coordinated planning and programming. Urgent interventions include unconditional cash transfers to enable drought-affected households to cover basic expenditure on food, health and shelter. 
You shouldn't be able to ride a bicycle across Utah's Great Salt Lake and not get wet. So when I first moved here three years ago, this area was still underwater. But that's unfortunately what University of Utah's scientist Kevin Perry can do as he studies the lake's dried out bottom, the water having dropped to its lowest level in recorded history in July, exposing 800 square miles of lake bed. Already, the lake's millions of birds are suffering as the disappearing lake robs them of nourishment, lower on food chain, while the people of Salt Lake City and surrounding areas are threatened by swelling toxic clouds of dust. Yeah, so as the lake has receded, it has exposed more than 800 square miles of lake bed. And just to put that into perspective, 800 square miles is about the same surface area as the island of Maui in Hawaii. And this exposed lake bed, when the wind is strong and the lake bed is dry, uh, it lifts dust off of this lake bed and pushes it into the surrounding communities. On the 3rd of July, the surface of the lake fell to the lowest level since records began in 1847, a drop that has exposed 2,000 square kilometers of lake bed. Formerly on the water surfaces have turned into dust clouds laced with cow germ, sulfur and arsenic a naturally occurring element linked to cancer and birth defects. Exposed lake bed is also contaminated with the residue from copper and silver mining. For years, water that would end up in the lake has been diverted for human consumption, industry and agriculture. That combined with a two-decade mega drought, one exacerbated by climate change, has exposed ever more lake bed. These pockets of dust spots only contribute 9% of the exposed lake bed. But Kevin believes it's enough to be worrying given the dust potential long-term impact on the public and the potential for further erosion. During the visit, Kevin showed an instrument he's using for current research that studies the moisture levels in the ground, how the particulates from these dust spots are connected and how they travel. The instrument creates wind conditions that can carry the particulate. It's part of a five-year National Science Foundation funded project called the Dust Squared Project. So the strong wind speeds in there started to break up the crust. And you can see that uh, that would be an area that once that crust starts to break up, you end up with dust that blows away. Uh, if you breathe that dust over an extended period of time, like decades or longer, then it can lead to increases in different types of cancer, uh, like lung cancer, bladder cancer, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, and such. And the element that I'm most concerned about is actually arsenic. The disappearing lake endangers more than just humans, also killing off reef-like structures that thrive on the water or dry out and turn gray when exposed. There's a brain shrimp right there. A couple, in fact. <laughs> All right, guys, here you go. Oh. Sort of green. It's sort of green. We've got the green in there. So attached on them are these brine fly pupae and Birds would dive down in the water to eat these guys for a food source. These guys are the foundation on top of this cyanobacteria that's this green community here. As this water line recedes, more of these microbialites are exposed and we'll no longer have green healthy microbialites. But instead, what we have there is this white grayed out structures that don't have life growing on them and usually these microbialites would be really green but out here it's super sad and devastating um, that these guys are exposed um, it wasn't like this last year half of the north american continent's wood dogs stage here while half of its redheads nest here coming out on an airboat Willard Spur is just absolutely phenomenal. Um, it's 
you know, to see these large congregations of birds um, with all these different species, you know, hundreds of American white pelicans, thousands of shorebirds, um, you know, cinnamon teal, uh, northern pintail, all the ducks that we have here. I mean, it's, it's just incredible to see these clouds of birds um, when you're riding in an airboat. What attracts so many birds is the unique habitat and the abundance of food. Ear grebes are, are a bird that a lot of people associate with, with Great Salt Lake. Uh, they come here in the fall in, to stage and fatten up in, on uh, brine shrimp. And they actually lose their flight feathers. They molt while they're here. Uh, and uh, if those brine shrimp are not there, you know, what happens to 90% of the population of ear grebes? We have somewhere around 4.7 million um, ear grebes in, in recent years that have staged here all at one time on Great Salt Lake. And so you can imagine either, you know, a catastrophic event or, um, you know, the ecosystem crashing. That could, you know, lead to uh, potentially uh, an extinction event for, for some of these species. Um, Salt Lake City also depends on the lake economically through tourism and is watching a source of up to $2 billion worth of annual economic activity, literally dry up. So we're in kind of uncharted territory here at Great Salt Lake. And uh, for those of us who spend a lot of time around the lake and are familiar with the ecosystem and the birds, you know, we're really concerned about, about the future and what could potentially happen. With public awareness and pressure to act growing, Utah's governor signed into law 11 bills related to water conservation and policy in the last legislative session. Among them, a bill which set up a $4 million trust for the Great Salt Lake with a quarter dedicated to habitat restoration. Another bill allows water rights to be given to the lake, a practice that was once seen as wasting water. There's been a sea change in that perception about the lake here just in the last two to three years. More and more people realize that the lake, we're connected to the lake whether we want to be or not. It, it protects our air quality. If it's not there, we're going to have a real dust problem that can affect human health. That can affect the airport, so it affects economic stuff. Uh, people are starting to realize just how much economy comes off the lake. It's about $1.5 to $2 billion worth of economic activity. 7,000 jobs spread over five counties. Um, those are all really important. But as we hit these new record lows, we start to run the risk that those, all of those values that we derive from the Great Salt Lake could be at risk. And I think people are, that's what they're really waking up and starting to realize. And that's what's driving this political pressure to do something. Yeah, sooner or later, something has to give. And kind of the way I put it to people is you can have, you can have growth, Right? But if you grow like you're continuing to grow, you're going to have to get rid of all your agriculture. So all that water is going to need to go to homes and businesses instead. Um, or you can take it all out of the environment. And then maybe the environment, you know, the Great Salt Lake goes dry and our other natural systems go dry. But what you can't have is you can't have your cake and eat it too. You can't have growth and then continue to live the way we, with the green lawns and everything else and continue to have agriculture and continue to have a healthy environment. And that's it on the program today. Thank you for being a part of it. Should you have any comments or questions, our inbox at file at channelstv.com is available anytime and any day. From all of us here in Lagos, it's bye for now.